Uh, thanks, John, and uh, hello, everyone. I uh, hope you can uh, see everything. Um, yeah, my name is uh, Julian. I'm with the Geological Survey of Denmark and Greenland, based in uh, Copenhagen. And before I get started, I want to acknowledge the help of my colleagues on this, uh, this work here. And uh, I will be talking about... Um, uh, just a second. I'll be talking about uh, groundwater table modeling at high spatial resolution using machine learning and process-based models. And then in many ways, this will be uh, different to the two talks that we just heard from Xiaopeng and Bray. And we're gonna be looking at a different variable and uh, also use a different uh, suit of uh, uh, machine learning uh, tools. Um, this is not gonna be based on uh, neural networks. Uh, we're using uh, decision trees. Uh, and also we are focusing on the, on, the, on the spatial detail and not so much on uh, simulating a time series. So just some, some, some background uh, years, we have around 300 people working here and 35 working in the, the Department of Hydrology. And we have a very strong modeling background um, using like uh, process-based models and uh, we have uh, recent machine learning applications. Um, I just include the map here of, uh, of, of Europe here, highlighting uh, Denmark, uh, because I'm going to show a lot, of, uh, a lot of maps of Denmark, just uh, to be sure that everyone knows where we are. So um, we're looking at the, the shallow groundwater system, and, um, and we, we define this uh, as sort of the, the, the top 10 meters uh, below surface. Um, the groundwater table within these uh, layers are, yeah, it's very heterogeneous. It's driven by uh, geology and uh, topography. And as you can see on, on the pictures here, that, that we, we, we have frequent uh, flood events that are triggered or, and or intensified by, by high water tables in this uh, shallow groundwater uh, system. Uh, because and this happens especially during during winter time where the where the aquifers are replenished and the water tables are generally high, then we have a low buffer for infiltration and extra pr pressure in the riparian zones due to like groundwater surface water interactions. And um, with the climate change, uh, we expect uh, wetter winters and um, rising water levels. And for yeah, uh, climate change adaptation. Uh, targeting these uh, flood risks, uh, information at high spatial resolution is uh, is needed. So uh, before I start talking about our machine learning work, I, I want to have a I want to use a few slides here on our process-based model, the, the National Water Resources Model, the DK model. Uh, we've been working on this for over 25 years, so this started many years before I, I started working here. It's, it's like a process-based coupled groundwater service water model. Uh, I mean, you can, you can read some of the bullet points here yourself. Um, uh, it's set up so, so it runs in uh, seven, seven sub-models covering 40, 43,000 square kilometers. And, and, and currently this, this is run at um, 500 meter resolution. And well, like a single single run takes around 10, 10 hours for the for the whole country for for a 20 30 year period, and uh, we're currently also working on a on a, on a hundred meter model. And we do calibrate the model uh, using uh, yeah a multivariable approach. Uh, we look at discharge and groundwater heads. This is all set up in in, in the past. So just for completion, I want to show. Here the results of uh, discharge, and uh, we're not going to not going to talk much more about discharge. But 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 just to give you here the idea that what sort of data we have, and we that we get like a reasonable performance for KGE, and then the, the water balance for for like the entire year, and and just for 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 summer conditions uh, based on these uh, 305 uh, stations. Um, I want to spend a little bit more time talking about the, the data that we have for, for the for the groundwater heads. Um, um, here here on the on, on the left you see you see the, the maps of the, the location of the of the wells for the for the shallow uh, groundwater system and the, and the deeper one. And uh, well, when you look at these maps, this looks like really really impressive at, at the first glance. Uh, we have around forty thousand intakes 
where, where 30 percent are located in the in the shallow groundwater system but but if you look a little bit closer uh, you, you find that that more than half of them 25,000 only have a single observation and um, that very few actually have a time series we have around 4,000 uh, worlds where we have more than 20 observations and if we if we want to apply like a even like like a, like a yeah, if we want, want to only filter the ones that where we actually get information on the annual amplitude, meaning that we have at least one observation a month for an entire year, we have only 700 left, 150 of them located in the, in the, in the shallow groundwater system. Uh, recently, we also started using uh, lakes for the calibration of, the, of our hydrological model, but also for the machine learning. Uh, these are lakes that are larger than 100 square meters. Uh, and these are lakes that we believe that they are connected with the, with the groundwater, uh, with the shallow groundwater. So, so this is a very heterogeneous data set to work with uh, for, for, for machine learning because you, you, don't, you don't have these nice long uh, time series as you, as you find for uh, stream flow. Um, this, is, this is quite different to, to work with. And then just quickly the, the performance of the of the, our national hydrological model, looking at the groundwater heads, here's some just some time series and they can often be biased, but the dynamics are more or less all right. And looking at the residuals for different calibration validation uh, experiments and uh, we don't need to go in too much detail, but some of the important message is that that even after calibrating these models and, and like couple of decades of working with this model and uh, revisiting the geology and the parameterization many times, we, we still end, end up having a, a, a root mean square error greater than five meters, a mean absolute error greater than three meters, and a mean error greater than one meters. And, and this doesn't vary too much between calibration and, and validation. I mean, like a process-based model, this is what we would expect right and and we also work with increasing the model resolution and and sort of these these metrics they don't change too much um, although we we believe that with a 100 meter model opposed to a 500 meter model we, we get like a more reliable uh, more reliable predictions but but anyhow so looking at these uh, metrics here this this is really like a good motivation to 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 start uh, applying machine learning because uh, and this was also highlighted in the previous talks that that we leave some information on the table and um, and then uh, our our take here is that that, that we believe that the process-based model has the potential to, to guide the machine learning model so um, this is here our framework very briefly uh, introduced. Um, um, so, so, so based on this situation here where you have like um, your, your target variable um, observed at, at points in the distributed space and you have covariates with yeah, varying uh, spatial resolutions but being continuous in space, um, uh, sort of what, have, what, what we find in the li literature uh, for, for many geospatial applications, for example, the, the, the soil grid uh, by Hengel et al. that, that uh, uh, models uh, soil texture at global scale. Uh, many of these exp uh, applications are based on decision tree machine learning models and uh, here especially the random forest regressor sort of stands out. And, and, and this is sort of the, the, the modeling tool that, that, that uh, we, we used. And I'm not going to talk too much about it. Um, please uh, reach out to me after the talk in case you want any, any, any more, any, any information. So, and then, then sort of our, our like very simple take to, 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 uh, to make this sort of like a process-based machine learning framework is to, to plug in like the simulation uh, result at uh, at course resolution of the of the target variable which would be like the the ground what i had here to then produce um, like uh, to make a prediction and to generalize for all grids at, at high spatial resolution 
So I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to lead you uh, through a case study where we applied this concept and this was uh, published uh, last year in, in HES. Uh, you find more information there. Um, so so we, we set up a random forest model to predict the uh, water levels of, of this shallow groundwater system at, at 50 meters spatial resolution. This was done for only like a, a sub-region of, of Denmark, uh, around 15,000 square kilometers. And uh, we reduced the uh, spatial dimension of our variable to, to a single instant uh, a snapshot. We wanted to predict the, win the winter time minimum depth because that is what we expect the, the yeah, minimum depth and the, the highest the flood risk. Uh, we included 27 covariates, including the decay model, the process based model. Uh, where we extracted the maximum simulated groundwater head. Um, for this study, we had data from 15,000 wells, and we saw all the, the red dots on the map here, and I will get back to this in a minute. And we also added sort of some domain knowledge uh, to, the, to the model by, by, by adding um, 2,000 additional data points along uh, coastline, rivers, and lakes where we set the depth to the groundwater to, 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 to zero because this is where we expect a connection between the surface and the groundwater. So these are the black ones here, but we didn't use all of them. We just ended up using 2000. So this, this slide here is, is, is on the data processing. And, and, and for me, this is really, really important because this highlights how, how we work with this very heterogeneous data set where we have some worlds with the long time series and, and, and many worlds where we, where we only have a, a single observation, which can be from different years, different seasons, uh, which, which doesn't really make it easy to, to work with this sort of data. So um, again, our aim was to represent uh, the wintertime uh, minimum condition, which we let's say expect in uh, mid-February. Mid, mid and for, for these top two examples here, A and B, where we have a lot of observations in black here, we can, we, we can just take the, the, the minimum depth uh, and, and, and use it as training data for, for this particular location. Um, and, uh, but but for, for, for different worlds where we have, for this one here, just, just one observation, or this one three, this, this is a bit more complicated. What, what, and what we did here is that we sort of build a, a sine curve model that reflects the um, the annual amplitude um, to to correct these um, uh, single observations, and um, these amplitudes were derived from um, 400 worlds where we had like uh, more than five observations. These uh, worlds were grouped into 27 27 hydrogeological hydrologic settings based on the permeability. Uh, defined, uh, confined, uh, unconfined uh, conditions and the distance to, to, to surface water bodies. And, and uh, from, 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 from these uh, wells with time series, we could then like learn something about the, the standard deviation, the amplitude, which varied between half a meter and uh, 1.5 meter. Um, and then we could use this information to, to build these uh, sine curve models and, and uh, Sort of make sure that, that, that our single observations were honored and then move this forward to like the February level where we expect the, the, the high water table and, and use this as a as training. So here, here are um, some results. This is the, the, the map at, at 50 meter resolution and, and high, like we, we zoom in for two areas here where we have like urban 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 areas where, 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 where information on the, on the shallow groundwater table is, uh, is quite uh, important. And uh, we could sort of highlight the, this, this flood risk because like 30% of the, of the cells of this uh, station area here have a, have a depth to the groundwater table of less than one meter. Uh, and here on the, on the right, uh, we, we show sort of the, the validation test. Uh, we used sort of the, the out of bag prediction, uh, of the, the random forest method, we, we also applied tenfold cross validation, gave more or less the same. We end up having a mean absolute error of 80 centimeters and a root mean square error of 1.1 meter. And, and if, you, if, you, if you remember the, the overall performance of the, the, the process based model, which was a, like a mean absolute error of, of more than three meters and the root mean square error of more than five meters, we, we get 
quite an quite an improvement here. Um, yeah, the interpretability of of this model was was also quite uh, important for us, and um, also to 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 show to the to the end users of this uh, data set. So so we looked at the covariate uh, importance, which we quantified uh, by means of uh, permutation accuracy, and uh, this was applied twofold. The first on the on the training data set, and and, and this is probably like a very very standard procedure where you uh, permute and. Um, uh, each uh, each variable or groups of variables, and then you uh, record the decrease in performance compared to the the unpermuted model. And uh, this we did here for the for the single variables in orange, or for uh, groups of variables that were sort of related to to sort of one source of information: here geology, topography, water body relation, and so on. Uh, and and uh, there was one variable that was standing out, which was like the vertical distance to the nearest water body, which sort of puts a, yeah, a, a, sort of the water body relation uh, of a, of a, of a grid. And, and 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 something that we were like very satisfied to see was that that the process based model output, the decay model, was 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 graded as the second most important variable. Uh, we also applied the permutation accuracy uh, to to the prediction data set, and, and this is maybe more like a novel way to use this. We've not seen this before in the literature. And uh, what what we did here, we uh, per permuted the groups of uh, covariates of the prediction data set, uh, and then looked at the deviation to sort of like the, the baseline model where nothing is permuted, uh, record the difference. We do this many times to converge to like a stable difference and then we can rank which group of uh, 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 permutation results in the largest uh, differences and then we can map this in space and here, here we see the, the, the map of the, the, the highest rank and uh, we, can, we can see that, that that parts of the area that are like where the geology is dominated by moraine, uh, clay, sediments here, the geology is the, the dominating uh, variable, and whereas in the other parts, it's it's like a topography and water body relation. And we also have like areas where where the hydrological model in red sort of. Out. So so this 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 comparison here is is uh, yeah we're comparing the the results of the machine learning uh, of the random forest model at 50 meters and the and our and uh, the process-based hydrological model. I mean, you can clearly see the, the two different uh, spatial resolutions, but, but, what, what, uh, but I think that this really sort of makes like the hydrological model happy and also does the, makes the machine learning model happy because we have like an overall resemblance here. You can see that some of the 500 meter grids sort of shine, shine through here, which I, I don't think is a big, big problem, but, but we can really see the re resemblance and we can also see that that the random forest here really adds a lot of spatial variability to sort of this this, this plain area where uh, the, the groundwater table is basically just uh, zero in the in the hydrological model we see some spatial variability here mainly driven through topography and we also see that that sort of we, we remove uh, the bias in, in these these locations where the groundwater table is rather So um, we were, for this project, this, this never made it to the to the paper. But for this project, we were also asked to to sort of apply this this machine learning model for for future conditions. And so so here the model had to do predictions like under non non stationarity climate change, and um, and here we we utilized um, the results from a climate change impact study uh, using the the process based model. Where we here had sort of a, a historic reference one run. This is uh, the groundwater head, um, and then and then um, we calculated the, the differences for like different different climate climate scenarios, and then there was like a, a scenario that was rated as like a typical wet scenario and a typical dry scenario, and and we can see for the wet scenario the water table rises for the dry scenario. The water table falls, but but this is not sort of genius in in space. We we see that that the landscape reacts differently to to this increase in precipitation, and uh, and, and this is of course like information that is um, uh, put into the uh, like uh, delivered by the hydrological model. 
that, that simulates ground water flow. Um, so um, our idea was here to, to sort of hack the, the training data set by, by, by using these uh, changes to, uh, to, to update the, the target variable in the training data set. So for, for a given well, we looked at what, what is the, the, the change simulated at the coinciding grid and then we, we added this to the to the train data set and retrained the random forest model and and um could, could sort of see what we expect that um for the wet scenario here that the colors get a little bit um, darker so indicating that, that the groundwater comes close to the groundwater table comes close to the surface of the dry scenario the falling groundwater table and and I did not include this, but but we can also look at sort of the the differences between reference and and sort of the, the climate scenario here. And we can see that they are not homogeneous in space. They sort of follow what was simulated by the process-based model. So they, these are somewhat in, in good agreement. Hey, Julie, okay, you're finishing up. I, yes, we have I'm several finished. questions, so go ahead. Okay, good, good. So, so, so this is going to be my, my last slide. And so, so we focus on spatial detail here, and I'm fully aware that this is a terrible simplification of the temporal dimension. Um, and we hope to, to work on this in the future. But, but I think this is like a straightforward implementation of, of, sort of incorporating information of process-based models into machine learning frameworks. Uh, and this could be very easy to transfer to other variables, uh, ET or soil moisture, where you have sort of like a similar starting point. And uh, currently we're working on updating our national model to 100 meter and, and, and this, this, this fall and winter we will also produce a 10 meter random forest model. Uh, not sure what, what modeling tool we use, but the 10 meter sort of version of what, what I presented before, just covering the entire country. So. Um, yeah, thank you, everyone. This was uh, my last slide. Thank you, Julian. So I have several questions. Uh, we'll see how many we can do. Um, first one is, uh, have you thought about using the wetland inventory? If you have one, I assume there's a wetland inventory as groundwater data since you're doing that for lakes. Uh, no, no, we have, we have, we have not. Uh, the, the, I mean, we have sort of like a wetland a wetland map among the covariates, uh, but 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 we have not added sort of uh, uh, data uh, at the wetlands. But I think that's a that's a good idea. Yeah. Okay. Uh, how important is the tidal signal on groundwater levels? Um, I mean, from the model as well as from your other uh, ob observations. This is referred to coastlines or coastal areas. Yeah. I, I assume uh, so. Yeah. Uh, I mean, we, we have like a simulation grid of 50 meters. Uh, I mean, maybe maybe a couple of grid cells into the coast, we would, we would see a response, but uh, not, not any further than that from, 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 from our experience. So, so okay. it, it is, not, it is not, not considered because we don't think it sort of affects the, the, the groundwater that much. Uh, okay, and then uh, the last of the three questions is uh, uh, the, and I'm not sure exactly how to ask this one, but I'm going to just read it out. Uh, your groundwater model seems to have some conceptualization error bias, as you showed on one of the slides. How does that affect your ML training? And I, I'm not sure exactly. Um, maybe go back to that slide where you were showing the conceptualization of the groundwater model. I'm not sure what what slide was 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 meant yeah. here, but I mean I mean of, of course that I mean that the model is the model is biased. It, I mean this is this is sort of this I'm not quite sure this this one or sort of in the beginning. Uh, but but I mean we 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 not we not really I mean we 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 sort of plugging the model the the, the process based model in as a covariate. So so of course it will be it will be wrong uh, at various places many places likely. But but sort of by adding the training data, we sort of make sure that it is honored in the right way, I hope, and that sort of the information is picked out there where it makes sense and then maybe left out there where it does not make sense. So I hope this, is, uh, this answers the question somehow. Yeah. Well, uh, additional questions may come later uh, during the, you know, at the end of this session. So thank you very much, Julian. Uh, and everybody, uh, 
We are now going to take a break and we'll start back up at 